We begin in Antonito, Colorado, where five locomotives are on display. It is the evening before the Victorian Iron Horse Roundup, an event celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Cumbres and Toltec Scenic Railroad. The restoration of DNRG 168 was recently completed, and the railroad brought visitors like the DNRGW 315, backdated to the DNRG 425, and the Eureka and Glenbrook Woodburners from Nevada. These two locomotives were both built in 1875, along with the other two that were built in 1883 and 1895. The roundup was scheduled to last 10 days, with excursions and special events planned throughout the week. Each visiting locomotive brought its own volunteer staff, and here they have a brief meeting before everything gets underway. Hundreds of people would make the trip to ride behind and see these classic machines. And on the morning of Saturday, August 22nd, the excitement was high. On this day, the DNRG 168 and the DNRG 425 would be taking a consist of historic passenger coaches to Bighorn and back. Before they could get started, the railroad had to get K36 489 out of the way as it was set to run the daily passenger train. With 489 out of the way, 168 and 425 can get ready for their trip. They'll be taking water, heading to the ash pit, then taking on coal. All the tracks and buildings in Antonito were built after the railroad took over in 1970. The original Rio Grande Main just went straight through here, with the majority of their yard north along the current standard gauge line. With 168 in the shop, 425 heads out to service for the day's trip.
Some water treatment chemicals are being added to the tender before the water will be added. The 425, also known as DNRGW315, is owned by the Durango Rail Historical Society and was restored to operation from 2001 to 2007. Meanwhile, 168 pulls forward to clear the track to the ash pit. In order for locomotives to take on coal, front end loaders are utilized as this is the most efficient way to do it on both ends of the railroad.
The train is assembled now, and with large crowds trackside, we head to our spot at State Line, or Gravity, Hill. This hill got named due to the angle of the curves, making the grade look steeper than it actually is. Here, 489 is leading the daily train up the grade. About 30 minutes behind the regular train is the special. The eastern end of the railroad is very difficult to chase with a lack of roads. What roads there are in the area are forest service roads, receive very little maintenance, and are very rocky. The smaller locomotives have to fill their tenders with water at lava, allowing us to get ahead. With the tank out of service, a tank car with a pump and a hose were placed at the loop to use. We take a look at the landscape while the train is at Bighorn. They are cutting off the 168, which will head to Antonito in front of the train. Blanca Peak is 14,351 feet in elevation and is 54 miles from our location.
While the train was on the line, lots of activity was taking place in the Antonito yard. Both wood burners were fired up, and Glenbrook made a test run out on the line. Upon our return, Eureka is being moved off the track it was fired up on. After it stops, we witness the lighting of the oil headlamp. We would soon learn that this was because the locomotive was to be test run on the main. The locomotive previously visited the CNTS in June of 1997. While we were out shooting Eureka, RGS-20 had the locomotive and the tender attached. The tender had just arrived earlier in the day. The RGS-20 was built in 1899, which meant it qualified for the event, but it wasn't ready when the planning processes were ongoing. The locomotive was brought to town for a handful of private charters taking place shortly after the roundup. RGS-20 would be placed in the shop, where it would spend the rest of the week. After this was completed, some locomotive shuffling would take place, readying things for the next day.
After Glenbrook was put in place, we looked to the west in time to spot Eureka returning from its test run. With Eureka back in town, it would be link and pin coupled to Glenbrook, and Sunday's train would be ready. Sunday's train would be the wood burners pulling the historic consist to Bighorn in return. The process for readying these locomotives is much different than the coal burners. Wood is carefully piled into the tender, but one of the things that makes these locomotives unique is the brass decorations on them. A lot of prep time is spent polishing these areas for a glimmering shine. Meanwhile, one well-known Eureka volunteer takes a moment to check the locomotive sand. This volunteer is a former employee of the railroad. With the lighting of the headlamp, things seemed to be progressing, but the Eureka still had not received its wood yet. After the wood was loaded, it was revealed that the Eureka had a brake valve gasket issue, and the crew of RGS-20 had a spare that could be used. With the fix in place, the locomotives were finally ready to head to the tank for water. An extension was used on the spout, which leaked a little. However, the small opening on Eureka still didn't quite line up, causing a large amount of water to flood out and almost all the way to the parking lot. With the train about to be assembled, we once again head out of town for a couple scenes. The RPO had been taken off the train in favor of a much lighter rider box.
The RPO is one of the heaviest cars on the railroad, and these two locomotives together have less tractive effort than the 168. Shortly around the curve, the Glenbrook would lose its steam pressure, causing the train to stop. This train will also be turning at Bighorn, but unlike the previous day, the locomotives will be double heading back down the grade. In the Rio Grande days, a special authorization was needed for this kind of move. The train is making good time heading down the hill, as the delays caused by the late departure and the steam pressure dropping meant this train was just minutes ahead of the daily train. We weren't able to beat this train into town, but upon our arrival, we catch the special clearing the station.
The locomotives are put away for the day, with the crews gaining some valuable experience. Sunday evening would be a quiet one on the railroad. Monday was billed as steam fest in town. All the locomotives were on display, allowing visitors to get up close and personal with the machines. In addition, crew members from the railroad and all visiting organizations were available to be talked to and for demonstrations. Which ran from basically Palisades on the, on the Central Pacific. Oh, yeah. Locomotives weren't the only attraction as cabooses were available to be toured with members of the Friends of the Cumbres and Toltec close by for questions and info. DRGW 0503, DRGW 0579, backdated as DNRG 0579, and RGS 0400 were the cabooses doing the honor. RGS 0400 is owned by the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden, but has been on lease to the railroad for a few years now. Next to the caboose track, the railroad was displaying their historic car restoration, where Paycar F was being restored. Paycar F will be the final car restored of the historic 1916 train. Also nearby, the friends of the Cumbres and Toltec were doing a work session at the car restoration facility. There were two cars being restored in here at this time, a DRGW drop bottom gone, and a Gramps UTLX tank car. Friends members were also willing to talk and answer questions about their projects. Remove all of the hardware, and it all has to be cataloged about where. And when they get ready to drop the ballast, the A-frame, the A-frame just lets the loads go out the appropriate side. And you're not to a certain degree, that is. Being an ongoing work session, there were still places the public couldn't go. The highlight of this day was a working demonstration of pile driver OB. The driver requires steam pressure from an attached locomotive, and a connection between the two allows the machine to get up to the required 115 pounds. Once the ladder is up, the machine can swing out on a series of wheels. There are four wheels underneath that the cab balances on, and the cab can swing out to the last one. There are many steps to get to this point, most of which are under the flat car. Once the cab is out, it is time to drive the pile.
watermelon squash. After the demonstration, a bit of fun was had as a watermelon, along with a piece of ballast, was placed on the pile to be smashed. With the day's activities complete, the OB is placed back at the CRF and preparations will begin for Tuesday's run. Today's run would be 168 and 425 running the historic train from Antonito to Osier and return. At Bighorn, the train will back onto the Y for the daily train to pass. This would take longer than anticipated though, as the daily train had a car with a hot box that would have to be set out at lava.
Now at Osier, the train will back onto the balloon track to turn for the return trip. This gives us a great look at our consist, starting with Tourist Immigrant Sleeper 470, built in 1889. The restoration of this car was completed by the friends about a week before the roundup. Next is Coach 292. This was the first car restored by the railroad and was completed in summer of 2018. Next is Coach DNRG 256. On the inside, the car is divided into two sections for different classes. Last is RPO 65. During its restoration, this car was built to accommodate wheelchairs and serves as a concession car with restrooms. The train would back around the balloon track, then would set off 425 so it could go ahead to Antonito. After this move was done, 168 backed the train to the water tank to fill before the return. As we round Lava Curve, we pass 425 on the loop track, picking up the car from the daily train with the hot journal.
As we return into Antonito, we get off the train in time to catch the wood burners returning to their track. Wednesday morning, the wood burners are getting ready as they're pulling a serious photographer's special spending all day between Antonito and Bighorn. This train would also have a little bit of a later departure time, so we set up near the end of yard limits for both the daily train and the special. On this day, they're running a mixed train, so their consist is a rider box, a rider gone, and two historic coaches. The train would get to Bighorn and perform several run-bys for the riders, as well as let the daily train pass. Several hours would pass before we'd see the train on its return trip to Antonito.
Trains on the Cumbres and Toltec are restricted to 10 hours on the main, giving the crew two buffer hours in hopes of keeping them from hitting their 12 service hours. Another water stop at Lava would allow us to get ahead of the train for another shot. An after sunset arrival into town would mean all the yard shuffling would take place after dark. We join the Thursday train as it departs the water stop at Lava. This train was Eureka and Glenbrook pulling the historic consist to Osier and back. Due to the early departure, the train would go into the siding at Sublette for the daily train to pass.
With the daily train out of the way, the special went back out onto the siding and head past us for wood and water. With it stopped, we get a good look at the Eureka, privately owned and restored by Dan Markoff. We move to the left and get a view of the wood line. Drop bottom guns were strategically placed for the visitors to restock at. We're at Osier now, where the same moves will take place from Tuesday. The train will back through the balloon track, then back for wood and water, then return to Antonito.
the end of this trip, a weather system moved in, bringing rain showers to the area. Because of this, we bid the Thursday trip farewell and start first thing Friday morning. On this day, all four locomotives would pull two separate trains to Chama. Our first view of this movement was outside Antonito. The two trains received special permission to run within 10 minutes of each other. All the passengers were riding in the passenger train, while the only people on the freight train were the volunteers of the Eureka and Glenbrook. We take a look at Bighorn Peak, where both the specials met the passenger train. There are panoramic views all across this railroad, but our current quiet is interrupted by the passenger train. daily train passes, we're surprised that our next visitor was not one of the special trains. After the jet disappeared, the distant chuffs of our two trains filled the air, with both even visible at the same time.
We set up high above Osier for our two trains arriving. A few hours have passed, and both trains are on the approach to Los Pinos. Here, both trains will take on water, while the passenger train will change crews. We've arrived at the summit of Cumbres Pass, 
where hundreds of people were waiting for the trains. One sixty eight would pull ahead, then back onto the Y, while four twenty five would pull the train forward to take on water. The visitors would arrive a few minutes later, and after taking on wood, they'd pull forward to add two boxcars onto the train for breaking help. While the two wood burners make a pickup, we head down to Coxo for the passenger train. The crew was having a hard time getting the speed right, chuffing pretty hard here, then continuing the trip slowly. With the pickup complete, 
the freight will pull forward to take water. We're already well past sunset, but with the time it takes to fill two tenders, the departure would be nearly pitch black. The train will head down in the cover of darkness, with 168 staying at the summit for the night. There weren't enough rested crews the night before, so it came down the hill Saturday morning. This would be a busy day, with two trains heading up the hill. Eureka and Glenbrook wait for their call in front of the old roundhouse, while 425 sits in front of the engine shop. While things are quiet over here, 487 is assembling the morning train for the wood burners.
The blue flag goes up for the Lincoln pin couplers to be attached. This process sped up with every attachment the locomotives made. While this is going on, well-known Eureka volunteer George Sapp makes some adjustments to a compressor. As the locomotives head out for their train, we leave the craziness of the yard to catch the train out on the main. The train would surprisingly stop at Lobato and the locomotives would uncouple for the trip across the trestle.
The roar has silenced as Eureka now sits by itself in Cresco siding. A blower issue caused the train to stall as it departed from its water stop. The train was backed into the siding and 425 was brought up to potentially help bring the train up, but by this time the daily train was in the picture. Eureka was fixed in place, the train was put in the siding, and the decision was made that 425 would pull the consist back down to Chama because 425 and both coaches were needed for the dinner train later the evening. Eureka and Glenbrook will be put away for the night while 168 and 425 ready for the dinner train. We're already a couple hours behind schedule by now, and that late time would continue to get worse.
With no event scheduled for the next day, Eureka's week would be done. A while later, we finally see the dinner train depart for the summit. Everything is quiet as Sunday morning rolls around. Eureka and Glenbrook sit out front of the roundhouse with the stacks being cleared of ash. 168 is sitting in the engine shop as on the dinner train run it suffered a broken eccentric strap and 425 sits in front of the depot with the train. Since nothing was scheduled, the friends took advantage to have demonstrations at the coal tipple. that this thing is still working. The and, only one uh, left. That metal curved piece at the top of the chute, that's going to open up and you see a few little bits of coal right there. If we, if we don't... After coal was spilled all over the main line, we were allowed to go inside to see all the mechanisms. But no, it has run. Probably 30 years ago. Okay. But we don't think it has as much compression that's required of it. So you guys are cranking this manually when you raise the buckets. Then. No, we're using this electric motor right now. Uh, oh, that's a retrofit uh, feature then. From back in the 30s. Yeah. Oh, so this actually did get used. When the motor is running, this this gear wheel and this gear wheel are running. Um, the drum that has the cable on it is not running until you take this lever over here and manually move it to over here. Okay. It engages the clutch. Okay. And uh, we have two cables here. One winds up this way and the other one winds up the opposite way. So that's how they're able they to go. Not, they, yeah. they, they work out. In the afternoon, Glenbrook was run over to the depot for an impromptu photo shoot with 425. Here we catch it on its return to the roundhouse. The Glenbrook is owned by the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City, Nevada.
Several hours would pass, and the sharp steam mines on the site would get 168 fixed just in time for the overnight train to Antonito. Plans were made for 425 and 487 to double head up the hill, but the quick fix allowed 168 to make the scheduled run. After it was put on the train, some of the crew inspect the repaired part. With everything all squared away, we follow the overnight train up the 4% grade on a chilly night. The train arrived at Ferguson's, or Hangman's, Trestle, an hour earlier than expected, so here it sits, awaiting some sunrise runbys. An interesting temperature inversion has caused the smoke to hang close to the ground. With the sun risen, several runbys would be performed for the riders of the train. The final train of the event is entering the yard limits in Antonito, and the event will soon be coming to an end. The event brought hundreds of people to the area, and with the visiting locomotives, vintage equipment, and spectacular scenery, 
It truly was a once in a lifetime event. Many people stayed for the whole event and everyone who did is glad for doing so. We want to thank you for spending the week with us at the Victorian Iron Horse Roundup.